Hey guys, um, today we are jumping into neurological disorders. So, you know, out of the rest of the things I teach this semester, this is probably one that's a little bit more exciting. I'm not a huge neuro person. Neuro is not for everybody, um, but I do think neuro kind of reminds me and involves some cardiac stuff. So I will take it. Um, and it is interesting. The brain is such a fascinating place. So we're going to start um, neurological disorders for med surge um, includes, uh, you know, where I teach, we're going to talk about tetanus, we're going to talk about neuro assessment, including like GCS versus level of conscious versus uh, versus orientation, um, just kind of talk really about the difference between level of consciousness and orientation, um, and why those assessments are important. Um, and then we're going to have headaches. And then I'll have separate PowerPoints for my new stroke lecture. All right, so let's dive in. This particular video is going to be specifically or more honed in onto tetanus. Um, so remember with this third unit, there's a lot of little pieces. So make sure that you're watching these shorter, smaller disease videos um, and the longer ones as well. Because um, even though you can kind of look at the blueprint and see like, hey, there's a lot more on stroke than there is tetanus, um, you know, if you miss so many of the small topics, it definitely makes it harder to be successful. So um, tetanus is a infection um, and it's an infection of the nervous system, which is why we're talking about it. Um, and it specifically affects uh, nerves um, in the spine and the uh, cr in the cranial nerves as well. And something you want to keep in mind about this is, is that if you're like, man, I've never heard about someone having this. Um, the reason for that is, is because of immunization. It definitely used to be more prevalent, but we don't really see it um, as much anymore because of vaccination. Um, pretty much what happens is this infection gets in, it binds to the motor nerves um, in the spinal and cranial nerves, and um, it stops them from being able to relax, which in, means they end up being like rigid and stuck, like kind of like a sustained muscle contraction. Um, so, you know, this is an infection, so obviously there's some sort of bacteria um, and you want to think about anytime there's an infection, like who's going to be more at risk. So someone with tetanus, um, someone to get, uh, to actually get and um, be affected by a tetanus vaccine, you have to be, a uh, tetanus vaccine, excuse me, to get and to be affected by a tetanus bacteria, you have to be exposed to the bacteria. So um, some places that it's found more often is you want to think about dirty places or um, places where there's soil, um, like in a garden, uh, places where mold might be growing, um, or like working on a farm if you're working with um, like animal excrements and stuff like that. Um, other places, though, like when I'm saying like places that things that might not be clean, um, it can be passed through like IV drug needles, um, human and animal bites, um, what do you call it also from like, you know, like the textbook thing that most people think of is, is that that person stepping, stepping on a rusty nail. Um, we also have already kind of talked about a little bit with thermal disorders, uh, and also with fractures that people that have frostbite are really high risk for tetanus, as well as those with an open fracture, um, people with burns, and then also those that have, uh, are victims of gunshot wounds, um, could be more at risk. So, and if you've seen this movie, super creepy, um, but um, yeah, good stuff. The reason I'll explain in a minute why I have um, her, her picture there is not just randomly there to creep you out. Um, so what does tetanus look like? So I told you tetanus is a bacteria that leads to like really rigid motor neurons. So pretty much think of like being stuck in like a ooh, like tensed state all the time. Um, so these people, it, it's an infection and it's an infection. So people with tetanus have a combination of muscle symptoms or that rigidity. And then they also have infection symptoms. Um, so the muscle symptoms they're going to have uh, is that rigidity. They can also have really bad spasms. Um, so I kind of think of most of it like being like in a constant state of having a Charlie horse, if you've ever had one of those. Um, so their muscles are very rigid. Um, they can have spasms or they can be super sore. Um, and this usually starts in their facial muscles and um, I can't remember the name of it now but your book talks the reason I have this picture is your book talks about that they can kind of have this crooked smile um, is one of the sometimes the first symptoms 
Um, but uh, because it's affecting your facial muscles um, and a lot first, we're also worried about our airway. So you should start thinking, you know, nursing priority, if it can affect or cause a rigid airway, like what could happen? It could, or, or spasms, you know, like rigidity and spasms. Well, if that's happening in my airway, what could happen? Well, then my airway could close. Um, so we're really concerned about a patent airway with this patient. Um, it also can affect the muscles of the neck, the back, the abdomen, and the extremities. So we're going to be keeping a close eye to make sure that um, they are not. Um, so, uh, so really think of it this way is that um, the big thing we're concerned about with these patients is their airway closing. But I'm also going to be concerned about them having constantly rigid muscles. If your muscles are in a state of constant tension, like it would be like, imagine like doing a squat and staying in that position forever. Like that's how your body feels. It's just like it's stuck in a position. What happens when you exercise or use your muscles is that it starts to break down. Like even when you do basic exercise, you go for a jog, you're working out at the gym, um, you do cause some muscle breakdown. It might not be intense, but you do cause some muscle breakdown working those muscles. And so um, as a result, like this is like getting a really intense workout, but you're not actually doing anything. It's like your muscles are forced to contract. So we can have a lot of muscle breakdown. So first I have airway closure, I have muscle breakdown. And then there's the fact that it just hurts. It's this is a very painful um, disease process. Uh, on top of that, you have infectious uh, uh, infection symptoms. Um, so you'd be looking for maybe a fever. And then um, depending on, of course, how they got tetanus, uh, they may have a wound or an entry site, et cetera. So priority assessment wise, um, of course, because there's an airway issue here, I'm doing my ABCs. So um, I'm going to start by assessing my airway for patency. And, you know, you hear this word thrown around a lot, like I'm going to check for patency, but you don't actually know what that means. So, you know, a lot of people like check an SPO2. And I mean, it might tell you something, but you're actually looking to see if their airway is patent. If someone's airway is not patent, um, like or signs of like poor airway patency, it's going to be like, are, do they have the ability to breathe? Like, are they able to talk to me? Or are they passed out? Because sometimes people that don't have a patent airway, they're not with me anymore. Um, and so um, it, it gets to the point, like, I mean, if I have no way to get oxygen in, um, there's, uh, you know, eventually my body's going to be like, nope, not eventually, like pretty quickly, my body's going to be like, nope. Um, but usually you're going to hear those signs of like a like poor um, oxygenation and like, and like with the, think of like when we talked about anaphylaxis and stuff like that, where the airway is actually closing. So you might hear stuff like strider or like that upper airway, like crowing sound, like <gasps> you know, it's, it's going to be really hard for them to be getting airway in. Um, they probably will be having difficulty breathing. They could have lower SpO2, um, things like that. But there's going to be signs that there's something not going well with um, their um, their airway. Um, you can also, uh, like, you know, you're not going to necessarily see a physical obstruction. Um, but, um, you know, uh, just in general, not for this patient, but like when I was talking about anaphylaxis, you can actually look and like see swelling and stuff there. Now for tetanus, there's not necessarily going to be swelling. There's just... Um, um, it's kind of like a spasm and stuff that can happen in their airway, um, which leads them to, again, have that kind of like that crowing sound, the um, the upper airway strider. Because um, remember, wheezing is in my lungs, striders in my upper airway. Um, and then we're going to be looking at, um, again, their work of breathing, their oxygenation. Uh, we want to assess their ability to speak and talk because that's a big thing. If my, my airway is not patent, um, if, if, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to connect that together because that's a big statement, but um, one sign that can show that's not very positive for someone having good airway patency is if they can't speak or they can't talk. Um, then I'm probably also going to do things like assessing their muscles for tone. Are they, um, are their muscles rigid? Um, is there spasms happening? Uh, what's their pain level? These are all going to be important things. And then a really priority thing is to assess their vaccine history because that's going to guide the treatment that we're going to do. Um, believe it or not, there's actually not a diagnostic test. There's not like a blood test we can do and be like, oh, they have tetanus. Um, so um, as a result of this, because this is something that like a bacteria that attaches to um, nerves in the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so it, it's very hard to test for. So um, that's why a really thorough history and signs and symptoms are so important because that's how the doctors diagnose this. Now, um, like I said, luckily, we it's very, very, very low prevalence of this. 
Um, but you can see, you know, in nursing school, you may be wondering like, why am I learning about this if we don't, we're not gonna really see it in practice. Um, this is that like, this is a very life or death thing. We're always gonna have to learn about this. I mean, maybe one day some of these are gonna be like gone, but um, they still do happen. Um, you know, and there is, um, you know, some movement and stuff. Uh, a lot of people today are not getting their children vaccinated or um, have different opinions about vaccination. So um, we don't really know what's gonna happen in the future. And there has been some surges in certain areas um, where there's low levels of vaccination uh, for things like tetanus. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. So how do I know tetanus is getting better or worse? So tetanus is better um, if the airway remains patent or becomes patent, you know, like there's the lack of spasm, they're oxygenating well, um, they're not having any difficulty breathing. I'd also look for decreased signs of infection that might be less of a fever. If they have a wound, it would be like, you know, they're not having any drainage from it. Um, it's starting to heal, et cetera, not showing any signs of infection. And then of course we want them to have decreased pain, decreased spasm and uh, better comfort. And then if the airway becomes obstructed, their breathing is poor, um, their oxygenation is going down. Um, and then um, if they're showing like new or worsening fever, um, purulate drainage from if they have a wound, um, their pain's getting worse, their spasm's getting worse. Another thing would be is, is because, um, you know, we talked a little bit about um, we talked a little bit about this in other sections, but um, rhabdomyolysis, um, which is a result of muscle breakdown, um, it also is possible that they could have some kidney issues and stuff like that. That's the only thing I'll add there. So um, as a whole, medically, what we're doing is, is I'm, um, you know, maintaining that airway patency, really trying to support that patient, make sure um, that they are able to uh, get the oxygen that they need. And most of these patients, because of such a high risk of their airway collapsing, um, they automatically earn um, uh, getting intubated. So just to support them while we're treating their tetanus, a lot of times these patients are on mechanical ventilation. Um, like I talked about, um, they can be at risk for having, uh, you know, issues with their creatinine um, and their kidneys getting overwhelmed because of muscle breakdown. They also could have an elevated CK, creatinine kinase. Um, and so a lot of times when we have a whole lot of a particle, what we'll do is we'll use IV fluids to dilute it. Um Infection management wise, uh, we're going to, uh, we'll talk about kind of like when we give people booster versus TIG, I'm going to talk about that next, but um, just a basic is, is that there's, uh, there's a booster for people that have already had their three base um uh, what do you call it? tetanus vaccinations? And we get those usually every 10 years. Um, but if it's been more than five years, a lot of times in suspected tetanus, we'll give you a booster. Um, with TIG, this is for people that have an active tetanus like right now. Um, and um, that's usually for people that are not immunized or have not had the, you know, the full uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, the full like uh, series of the tetanus. Uh, then we also on top of doing the like the vaccinations and uh, different other treatments that are specific with tetanus. We also do antibiotics because um, we really don't want any more bacterial growth and we're really going to be doing thorough wound care. Uh, medication the patient may receive since they're on the ventilator and they're having that rigid pattern like anti-anxiety, um, muscle relaxers um, to help with the muscle spasms, pain management is going to be key for these patients. And of course, to prevent long term, um, you know, just getting that Tdap or that booster every 10 years after you receive the three of the series. So this is a table in your book that kind of helps guide and now, you know, there's going to be a question about some patient, like, what are we going to give them? Um, so think of it this way. So like I said, first, um, when someone, uh, you know, when, when we're young, what we do to help prevent tetanus is, is that we give um, a three dose series um, in order to, you know, be considered covered for tetanus. But um, it has been found that over time that this um, protection fades. So every 10 years we get what's called a booster. Um, and so mo for most people, that's fine. They don't have to, they don't need anything else. But what can happen is, is if people are either really high risk showing signs of tetanus um, or like even some of those patients we talked about, like the open fractures, the, um, oh, what do you call it, um, frostbite, stuff like that, they're going to be higher risk for um, getting tetanus um, uh, because of their injuries. So in that case, sometimes we consider giving them a booster a little bit more frequently. So effectively, if it's been less than five years, you've had, let me put this way, let's say if you've had 
all doses of the, the three doses of the series, and it's been less than five years since your last booster, there is no indication or need for you to get the Tdapt. Um, if it has been, um, you know, like five to 10 years um, since your um, last dose, of um, getting your, um, you know, you've had your three ser like three part series of your vaccine. It's been five to ten years since the last dose, and it's a minor wound. You're probably not going to need anything. But what if it's a little deeper? Like most of the people we talk about, like the open fractures, um, stuff like that. They're usually going to need the Tdap. Um, and then if it's been greater than ten years no matter what, they're going to need the booster. So pretty much think of it like this. If it's been less than five years, you probably don't need anything. And again, every a doctor will decide this. They don't pull out this table and say like, well, nursing school says, but I mean, generally this is the what's followed. This is that less than five years, no treatments needed. If it's been five to 10 years, if it's like, you know, um, more than just a clean or really small wound, um, they're probably going to need some sort of um, booster done. Um, and then if it's been greater than 10 years, everyone's going to need that booster, no matter what kind of wound, because um, it's been 10 years and you need a booster every 10 years. Now, if we do not know and uh, you're not sure about how if you've um, received the tetanus vaccine on um, the full series um, or if you've had less than three doses, um, usually um, even if it's a cleaner minor wound, you know, we're going to um, try to do the catch up vaccine and you may need a booster. Um, if it's a really dirty wound um, and um, things like that, we're going to do the same thing, except we're going to add what's called TIG. And what TIG is, is, is that, um, well, let me back up, back up. The, the booster and the vaccination provides protection, but it takes usually at least two weeks to really start to have an effect or to be helpful. Um, so with those patients, they're going to need something more like right now. Like if they are not, like they don't even have the base three, you know, three, um, series coverage, they need something right now. And especially like TIG is also used for people like that have actual tetanus. Um, so, I mean, the people, some people that have actual tetanus may, actually get the TIG too, but I promise we're not going to give you anything too, too tricky there. Um, but um, the TIG, what it is, is it's actual um, uh, immunoglobulin or it's actual like, um, it, it's uh, part, I don't know, I want to try to say it in a way that won't confuse you too much. It's actual particles that can help you to fight right now. So the Tdap is going to take two weeks to really start helping at all. Um, whereas the TIG is going to right now start providing some immune support and stuff like that. So that's especially helpful if you haven't received enough or any of the tetanus series. And then it's also going to be helpful um, when it comes to um, patients that have active tetanus, because even if they have had some of the vaccination support, they're fighting tetanus right now. So they need that extra support. So let's um, let's look at some of these scenarios and see if we can kind of break it down because it always helps to kind of put it into scenarios. So we need to say if they have no need no action, a tetanus booster, TIG, or other treatment. Mm -hmm. So a client has had two doses of the tetanus vaccine and has an open femur fracture. So this is a person who has not received um, the like the full three doses of the tetanus vaccine. They've only received two. Um, so they have not had the full series and they have an open femur fracture. So what you really want to think of here when you're looking at a question like this is say like, okay, do they have their base coverage? Um, are they up to date? And then do they have a risk for tetanus or is there something about them that is going to put them at risk for tetanus? So this person does not have their base, does not have any boosters, and they have a risk for tetanus. So because of that, we're going to need to probably do like a catch-up vaccine with them. They're going to need a booster, um, and they're probably also going to need the TIG if, um, uh, what do you call it, if they're really high risk, just depends on the severity of their wound. Uh, the second one, client has had three doses of the vaccine. Three doses means they have their base. So this person has their base. Um, and it says they got their last booster three years ago. So remember, we're supposed to get it every 10 years. Um, and they have frostbite. So it's only been three years since their last thing. So remember, if it's they're up to date on their series, um, if it's been less than five years, there's usually no treatment needed because they're they're very um, they're going to have um, the support that they need. A doctor can decide if they're concerned otherwise, but generally this person's probably okay. They don't need any treatment. 
All right, Klein has had three doses of the tetanus vaccine. Okay, so they're up to date on their series. They got their last booster seven years ago. So they're not quite at that 10 yet, but we have to see if they have a risk for tetanus. So seven years ago, and they're an IV drug user with a dirty wound. Um, so that does put them at risk being an IV drug user. Um, so and since her last booster was seven years ago, we're probably going to need a booster shot. Now they don't like they're up to date on their series. So they don't need a catch up vaccine. Um, it has hasn't um uh it hasn't been uh what do you uh, no no i'm not even gonna say that because i don't want to confuse y'all um but um so um it's they've had their base and so once you've had your base three we really just look at giving you a booster um is really all you're gonna need once you've had your base so they've had their base um and so as a result of that um and it but it's been seven years since they've had their booster and now they have a really high risk for tetanus with this dirty wound so they'll probably just need to get another booster because it's been more than five years all right, so Klein had one dose of the tetanus vaccine, so they are not up to date on their um, tetanus vaccine, and they have a closed wrist fracture. Um, so we have to remember, like, they have to have a risk for tetanus. We're not just like, oh, my goodness, this patient only had one dose of the tetanus vaccine. Get them quick. Like, get them the TIG. So this patient has a closed wrist fracture. Remember, it's an open wrist fracture. Uh, it would be an open fracture that puts this patient at risk. So with this patient, I'm not saying that we're not going to do anything. We may pro we probably need to see if we can get them um, finished in their um, tetanus series because they're behind possibly depend on it doesn't say anything about age or where they're at um, but it, they've only had one dose but they have a closed wrist fracture so there's not like an immediate like oh my goodness quick like they probably need to finish their um, tetanus series um, but um, there's not like an immediate need for um, a booster a catch-up or anything like that um a uh, client has two do has had two doses of the tetanus vaccine so they haven't had the three part series yet and they have a minor cut on their hand that they sustained while gardening so it's a minor cut but they were gardening which is a risk factor for tetanus. So if they've had two doses of the tetanus vaccine, um, this means that we need to probably do a catch-up vaccine. They're probably gonna need a booster. Um, since it's a minor cut, they may not need that TIG, um, but it just kind of depends on the doctor and what they're concerned about the risk. But pretty much we just need to catch this person up because they haven't had their original series yet. Um, and so we need to catch them up. And again, they may need to catch up vaccine, booster, and then um, just lots of third a wound care. All right, so Klein has had three doses of the tetanus vaccine, so they've had their series, and they got their last booster 13 years ago, and they have suspected tetanus from a gunshot wound. So this person has had their base, but it's been 13 years since they've had um, their last, um, uh, what do you call them, um, their last tetanus. Now, as a result of this, it's been over 10 years, which means no matter what, they need a booster, but they have suspected tetanus. So most likely they're going to get a booster, but if they actually come out with having tetanus, you know, they may consider doing the TIG. It just depends on um, how the patient's doing, but most likely as of just the information's given um, based on that table, I showed you really all they're, they're going to need at this point is a booster. Hopefully those scenarios helped you. All right, so as the nurse, what am I gonna do? Um, frequent neuro and musculoskeletal assessments. I'm monitoring the airway. I'm monitoring their muscle tone, things like that. I'm regularly managing their pain and spasms and giving medications and um, as appropriate. Um, we talked about monitoring kidney function um, because of muscle breakdown, possibly from rhabdo. Um, and then I'm also wanting to manage their infection. So I'm um, checking their temperature, looking at their wounds. And, you know, we definitely want to see those wounds, hopefully no drainage, but no purulent drainage, um, keeping the wounds clean, doing regular wound care, and then uh, definitely vaccine education, teaching them how to um, avoid the tetanus bacteria, general hygiene. Um, and then if it's an IV drug user, we teach them the clean needle program, um, and if you don't know what that is, effectively, it's that, you know, like some people are going to be IV drug users, no matter what the education, the education would be great if we could tell them, you know, this, it's not recommended um, for IV drug use. Um, but there are programs out there that if they're going to use IV drugs, that at least we try to provide them with clean needles, so they have a less chance of having complications from their um, drug use. So yeah, so that's it. The next video will be all about increased ICP. See you for that one.